Um, all right, if you have your Bibles, you can start turning with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, very, very, I, it's important, just a very important, it's all important. Um, start talking about a very controversial subject Paul's going to deal with, gifts of the Spirit. And, you know, up until this point, very, very, you know, just kind of, Paul, th- remember, this, this letter is very corrective in nature, okay? So as we read these things, you know, you have to understand, you've got to put yourself in the story. Uh, remember that the Corinthian church had a lot of things right, they had a lot of things wrong. They had a lot of issues, man. They had some things that, were, uh, that they were dealing with corporately. And from chapter 7 on, Paul says that he's dealing with the things that they had wrote to him about. Okay, Paul is having to deal with the questions that they had, the questions that the church at Corinth had, and there was a lot of them. There were some things happening out of order. And from chapter 11, 12, 13, all the way to the end of 14, Paul is having to deal with order in the corporate church, okay, order in how we are to come together and to worship, how we are to come together and edify how things are supposed to go by way of gifts, and certainly we we remember that we covered uh, how we are supposed to be operating in love. He puts the love chapter kind of in the middle of all of this. You know, 1 Corinthians 13, let everything be done in agape love, right? Everything be done. So it's not ever just about the gifts of the individual, okay? It's about the gifter, all right? It's not about the person who has the abilities, but it's about the one who's given those abilities. And, um, PJ, want to turn me down just a skosh, buddy? I'm just a little hot. Um, not much, bro, just a little bit. So it's always, it's more about the person who has been given the gift by the gifter. You understand? This is why church is important. This is why coming together is important. We want to use the gifts that God has given us. We want to use the abilities that God has given us. We should want, we should desire spiritual gifts. And Paul's going to get into that here in a second. But it should never be about you. You understand? It should never be about you and look at me and look at the spiritual gifts that God has given me. Look at the abilities that God has given me. And by the way, you know, if for whatever chance you come to a church and you're there for a little while, because listen, we're a growing church, right? We're a young church. We're growing, growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We'll have people from time to time will come in and they will say, well, I'm gifted in this. I, I have the ability to do this. You know, some will say that I have the gift of prophecy. Some will say I have the gift of healing. Some will say that I have the gift of knowledge and whatever. And that's all great and good stuff. But if I don't know you, I'm not just going to hand you the pulpit. Do you, do you understand that? So if I don't know you, if we don't know you as a leadership team, it, it, it's irresponsible of us to just sit there and go on your word. I don't know what you're going to say. You know, the Bible says, let them first be tested. The Bible also said, let the spirit be tested. So it behooves us as leadership to sit there and say, okay, well, this person has got the gift of prophecy. That's wonderful. But I don't know that. I don't know that this person has this ability. And by the way, I don't even know if if they're a true prophet or a false prophet. So we have to test those things. Now, in, in speaking of the gift of tongues, for those who may believe that it is a foreign gift for those who may believe that it has ceased as the cessationists would believe um, some really wonderful teachers of the word of god okay some guys some really notable guys um, in the church at large today believe that spiritual gifts even more specifically the gift of prophecy in tongues is the thing that's, that has been done away with okay um, nothing in the bible would lead us to believe that There's no scripture saying that these things will be done away. When that which is perfect has come in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not talking about the word of God. We don't worship the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. Do you understand? We worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And spiritual gifts are given to men and to women to edify the body. Spiritual gifts are given to the church for the edification. We're going to get into that today. And so this is not a gift that has been done away with. However, (laughs) it is a gift where there's a lot of controversy surrounding this one. There are churches that take this completely out of context and just go crazy with it to the point where they'll tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not filled with the Spirit. They go crazy with it. the, The proof of 
the filling or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is whether or not you have the ability to speak in tongues. And that is false. That is false. That is not true. Exegetically, hermeneutically, nothing, nothing speaks to that. However, then there are people who go the complete other way and say, if you speak in tongues, not only are you not spiritual, but you're speaking a demonic language. And that's not true either. It's just not true. I don't know where they come from with that. And again, there, there are those very beloved brothers, man, who teach this stuff. And we're going to get into it. Paul gives us an entire chapter dedicated to the subject. Do you understand? Let me just, let me just break this down for you, church. For God to say one thing is enough, right? If he says one thing in the Word of God, that's enough. If he repeats it, that he definitely wants you to pay attention. If he dedicates an entire chapter to a particular subject... He wants you just to get it right, man. He's not looking to say, this gift is gone. This was for the church at Corinth, and it's not for the, not for the church today. He wants you to get it, but get it right. He's going to give us instruction. He's going to break it down for us, word by word and line by line, on how this gift is to operate. Why? Because there's so much division in the church today, just like there was division in the church back at Corinth. People were using this gift out of order. People were getting all worried and all upset that they weren't using this particular gift, or they were standing up in the middle of church while the pastor's trying to preach, and they were using this gift out of order. And Paul says, listen, time out. Concerning the things that you wrote to me in 1 Corinthians 7, this was clearly a problem that they had to write to Paul about. So we're going to get through this. Then we're going to get into there's some controversial verses towards the end. We'll clarify some of those things. But what he says here in the first verse is this. Pursue love. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But notice how he doesn't say desire love. He says pursue it. Pursue love. If you're going to go after anything, right? If you're really going to go after something, if you want to be effective in the body of Christ, you want to be effective in your ministry, you want to be effective in your life for the cause of Christ, you want to be effective in the life of your wife, your husband, your children, people within your sphere of influence, you want to be effective in your workplace, you want to be effective, he says, pursue love. And just remember this. Remember, everything should be filtered through Love. He gave us 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is very explicit. Let everything be done in love. Right? So what does he say? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And the word prophesy, just so we're clear on this, the word prophesy literally means in the Greek foretelling. That's what he's saying foretelling. You have the ability to prophesy. You have the ability to speak blessings into someone's life. He's going to define for us what that is. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, real quick, right off the rip, he who speaks in a tongue, going on the word of God and what it says, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men. Okay? You guys are reading the same Bible I am, I hope. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So that's the first thing we got to see. Is number one, whoever's speaking in a tongue is not speaking to the church. It's speaking to God. Whoever's speaking in a tongue, real quick, is not speaking prophetically to the church. They're speaking to God. Okay? But he who prophesies speaks edification and ed exhortation and comfort to men. Three things we see in verse 3. Anybody who prophesies, anybody who's speaking prophetically over the body of Christ, this is what you're going to see. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. That is how you filter whether or not a prophecy is legit or not. Does it edify? Does it exhort does it comfort those are the three things those are the things you look for if somebody stood up in this pulpit today and they say thus saith the lord listen and just so we're clear in this we're going to get into that anybody who says thus saith the lord they're not speaking for the lord the lord has already thus said 
very clear. Anybody who stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, number one, first of all, right off the rip, they're out of order. Number two, if what they have to say is, thus saith the Lord, if we don't turn and repent as a church, everyone in here is going to get the botch. <laughs> okay. Anybody who doesn't know what the botch is, that's good. If you know what the botch is, then that's bad. You're going to break out in boils and sores all over your body. I don't know. It's not really comforting to hear that. That's not really encouraging. I mean, that's not really things that I want to hear to edify. And all too often times, that's what we hear and that's what we see. That's what we see sometimes. We see, we see somebody will stand up and say, I got a word for the church. I got a prophetic word for the church. And they'll stand up. And they'll stand up and what they'll say is this. They'll stand up and just really start to denounce the church. This is a word. This is a prophetic word. Okay. It might be a warning. But that's not a prophetic word, man. Not according to the word of God. In verse 4, he says, He who speaks in a tongue, now note this, again, really simple. This is really simple, and I really wish, I really do wish. And again, I grew up, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, okay? I grew up going to a Pentecostal church. And they were, whoop, whoop, really Pentecostal. I mean, I'm talking tambourine shaking, foot stomping, you know, people falling down in the aisles, like, you know, flopping around like fish, really, really Pentecostal church, right? Really Pentecostal where people would come up and lay hands on you and, you know, you'd be slain in the spirit. And, oh. Okay. That's the church I grew up in. They had this out of order. They were operating out of order. Why? Because when you would go to a church like that, what would you see? You'd see a room full of people speaking in tongues, and we're going to get into it, or prophesying in tongues. What he says here is he who speaks in a tongue edifies who? Note this. Look at it in verse 4. Read it with me so you know that I'm not lying. He who speaks in a tongue edifies who? Himself. I'm going to say it again. He who speaks in a tongue edifies who? Himself. Himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Really simple. Somebody who prophesies, somebody who speaks words of edification and comfort and exhortation, that edifies the church. That's for corporate worship. For somebody who speaks in a tongue, that is for himself. But we're going to get into this as well. If somebody wants to stand up and speak in a tongue, they have to have that what? Interpreted. Otherwise, it's no good. Otherwise, you're just speaking into the air is what Paul's going to say. Note this. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Do you see that? Unless he interprets. If he speaks with a tongue, then you've got to interpret it. And by the way, this interpretation, just to clarify, this interpretation doesn't have to come from someone else. The interpretation, really simple, says, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. If, if somebody's going to stand up and speak in a tongue, then he's going to have to interpret that, or there's going to have to be an interpreter present. Why? Because that's the only way it edifies the body. Otherwise, it's just edifying themselves. And what happens a lot of times is that will happen. In the church, we'll start to see this person, that person. We get four, five, six people standing up speaking in a tongue, and it all really looks super hyper-spiritual and great. Meanwhile, it's not edifying anybody except for themselves. And so people want to stand up and they want to speak in a tongue because they just want to show off their spiritual gift. And if you stop it, you're quenching the spirit. Meanwhile, it needs to be done in order. And God is not a God of disorder or confusion. Do you understand? Now we're going to get into it. This whole chapter breaks it down. And I said this at the first service. I'll say it here. Man, I really wish that some Pentecostal church had just read this. I wish they just read it. Because it really explains it. I really just want them to read it. Because if they got it right, it would be such a blessing. But they don't, some of them. So now watch this. Now, brethren. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, 
by prophesying or by teaching. In other words, there's no profit in just tongues alone. There's no profit in just going to a church, showing up, speaking in tongues, and leaving. There's no benefit. Nobody's going to be edified by that. So what does it say? What shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, direct revelation, which apostles had, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching, expounding on the word of God. What benefit is it going to be to you? If I, what benefit is it going to be to you if I just stand up here and go yabba dabba 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 and leave? There's not going to be any benefit. And listen, by the way, just so we're clear on this, I'm a Pentecostal dude. I pray in tongues. I know this gift. I'm familiar with it. I pray in tongues. I pray in tongues all the time. But it's not beneficial for me to come up here and pray in tongues and leave. It's not beneficial for you. It would work out for me great. But it's not beneficial to you. It's not beneficial to the body of Christ. It's not going to do you any good unless I come up and teach, prophesy, preach, edify, comfort, exhort, encourage, challenge. In verse 6, he says this, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is being piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? And so really simple. He uses a very good analogy for us. If all of a sudden you have a musical instrument, if any, anybody here who have ever learned how to play the flute, okay, playing the flute is really difficult, right? But you ever get, put a flute up to somebody's mouth who doesn't know how to play? It's horrible. Horrible. When years ago, when I first started, I was a young kid. <laughs> my, my parents thought it would be great for me to learn how to play the trumpet, right? So I did. I was living in the city, and I would stand out on my front porch, and I would just play this thing on the front porch. <laughs> it was better for them for me to irritate the neighbors than my parents, you know? And I would play this trumpet on the front porch of my house. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, it was horrible. And that's what he's saying. He says, how do you know? Unless you put together this instrument, unless you play it and you know the notes, you know how to play the instruments, all it's going to sound like is just noise. That's all it's going to sound like is noise. And then he uses the soldiers. He says, listen, you blow a trumpet, soldiers know what the trumpet, what, which trumpet sound means what. They know, according to the blowing of the trumpet, it's supposed to be clear. It's supposed to bring understanding to people. It's supposed to inform the soldier when the trumpet blows. So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. You're speaking literally to no one, unless you're speaking for edification. You'll be speaking into the air. And he gives us another example. There are it may be so many kinds of languages. There are so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Tongues is a foreign language. Do you understand? Tongues is a foreign language. It's a spiritual language, and it's not gone by the wayside. It's not. It's a spiritual language. It's to be understood spiritually, which means when you see someone speaking in a tongue and someone else with no interpretation and somebody else in the church amens that, they don't know what they're talking about. Do you understand? You can all say amen. Amen, because I'm talking in a language that you understand, right? When you see somebody speaking a tongue and somebody else just stands up and goes, Amen, what are you amening? You have no clue what that person just said. No idea. Well, my spirit knows. No, it doesn't. The spirit only knows what you speak in a tongue. Not your brain. Not your mind. You're not edified at all by what that person just spoke in a tongue unless it's been interpreted. And so he uses the analogy of other languages. Listen, have you ever tried talking to somebody who speaks another language? Okay, it's the, it's the funniest thing in the world. Because any time, like especially here in America, you speak to somebody who doesn't speak English, all of a sudden, 
the volume of your voice goes up. You are looking for the bathroom. And all of a sudden, you think that you have to raise your voice like 20 decibels because somehow volume affects interpretation. You talk to somebody from outside the country who doesn't speak your language, you're just going to look at each other and just smile. And <laughs> I don't even know. You're going, to them, you sound like, blah, 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 blah. they're talking to you, blah, 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 blah. and it's like, <laughs> I guess we're done here. You, it makes no sense. You just try, you know, you, you, all of a sudden you become a mime. You know, you're trying to like, you know, it's like Pictionary. You're trying to, you know. He says, if you speak in a tongue, nobody's going to understand you. It's a spiritual language. Therefore, in verse 11, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, which, by the way, is a good thing, you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel, not for yourself. Let it be for the exhortation of the church. If you desire spiritual gifts, then it should be for the encouragement and the benefit of the body, not you. If all of a sudden, you know, and again, we've had to deal with this in the past. You know, people will come into the church. You know, I'm just not using my gifts. I'm not using my gifts. I'm not using my gifts. I'm leaving. I'm not feeling edified. If you just want to use your gifts so that you feel edified, then you're using your gifts for the wrong reason anyway. Because it's not about you, man. It's not about us. It's not about just us individually. It's about us edifying one another corporately, using the abilities that God has given us so that we can be an encouragement to each other, so that the church body can be built up. And so, let him who speaks in verse 13. He says, therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Do you see that? If he speaks in a tongue, if somebody speaks in a tongue, pray that he may interpret. You don't need somebody else to interpret as was commonly thought and believed and propagated in other churches. You can interpret. You have the ability to interpret. If you speak in a tongue corporately, you have the ability to edify that tongue in which you spoke. Now listen, I don't even really need to do much by way of teaching on any of this. This stuff is the stuff that just teaches itself. All you got to do is read it. It really speaks to itself. We're going to get into some very confusing things in a couple of minutes here. What is the conclusion? Well, we would think that this was the conclusion, but Paul continues. What is the conclusion then? In verse 15, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Praying and singing should be edifying to your mind and your spirit. You understand? Worship should be edifying not just your spirit, but your intellect as well. You pray in the spirit, wonderful. Pray with understanding too. What would you ask for God or from the Lord? How would you pray prayers of supplication or prayers of intercession if you were constantly just praying spiritual tongues all the time? You pray in the Spirit, amen. You need to pray with also understanding so that you know what it is you're praying for. You got a laundry list of prayers. If you don't, I mean, I don't know, I do. I got a laundry list of things I'm going to the Lord for right now. Laundry list. But I also pray in the Spirit. When we come together and we worship, we worship in spirit and in truth. We come together and we worship, we praise, we lift up our voices to heaven. We come together, and what do we do? We all sing the same words, the same way. There's order in that. There's order. There's something supernatural and spiritual that comes together. Listen, if all of a sudden somebody in the church just starts singing, you know, we start singing, you know, a wonderful, beautiful hymn that we sung today. We start singing that song, but yet then all of a sudden somebody else just starts singing like Rock of Ages on their own because they want to be fed something different. That's out of order. Now you're just... You're causing disruption in the service. You're completely out of order. Why? Because you just want to do what you want to do? All of a sudden, everybody here, standing, worshiping, clapping, raising their hands, doing whatever, all in order. All of a sudden, somebody just takes out a tambourine from their purse and starts playing it. Everybody turns around and looks. That's out of order. It's out of order. But I want to do this. This is how I get fed but you're disrupting the service. It's not edifying anybody. You just want to do what you want to do. 
It's not serving any good purpose. It's causing confusion here in the church. Well, I want to start dancing. <laughs> Why? You can't. You can't dance. You might think you can, but you cannot. And now you want to start dancing in church. You want to start dancing and jumping around like a fool. You're the only one doing it. And it's not edifying anybody. If you want to dance like that, man, feel free to go home and turn on some worship music and dance to your little heart's content. But all of a sudden we come together in the church and people just want to say, look at me, look at what I'm doing, look at how spiritual I am, look at me using my gifts, look at me and just kind of jumping around and sweating. I really love Jesus. Check out my tambourine. That's what happens. And then it's not really about you. Or ra rather, it's not really about the church. It's just about you. It's not about Christ. It's just about you. It's just about you. And that's the honest truth. Otherwise, in verse 16, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? And listen, it's worth noting that when somebody prays in a tongue, the thus saith the Lord kind of prayers don't line up with Scripture. Because you remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, empowered those who were in the upper room, fell like cloven tongues of fire, as it were. They started lifting up their voices to heaven. They started doing what? Praising God. That's what tongues does. It praises the Lord. And so what did all of those other people they were from, they, that were from different nations, different tongues, they heard all of those folks, the 120 in the upper room, praising God in their native language. But what were they doing? Were they prophesying, thus saith the Lord? Nope. They were praising the Lord. That's what tongues does. It praises the Lord. And if you hear someone praying in a tongue, Verse 16 just explains perfectly what I just said. If you hear somebody praying in a tongue, and all of a sudden you hear, and there's no interpretation, you have no idea what this person just spoke, and you hear somebody else stand up and say, Amen, brother, or Amen, sister. <clears throat> I don't know what you're amening. Really simple. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen, at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say. I don't know how simple it can get. It, can, it can't get any easier. If somebody stands up and says amen, they're not amening anything. They just don't, they don't have no clue what you're saying. It doesn't make any sense. For you, indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. You give thanks with your spirit, but that's, and that's fine. You give thanks, and that's cool. You pray in the tongue, you pray in the spirit, that's fine. You give thanks with your spirit, and that's cool. But no one else is going to be edified from that. I thank my God. Look at this in verse 18. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Now watch this. If it was something that was so important, at this point, Paul would say, if you want to be like me, you got to pray in tongue all the time. If you want to be effective in ministry, you need to pray in the Spirit all the time. This would be the point that he would say that. But you know what he says? Yet, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple. Because that's what happens. That, that, that's what we sound like. That's what we'll sound like. It's pretty simple. I would rather you speak five words in a known tongue because that edifies everybody than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue because that doesn't edify anybody but you. The benefit, corporately speaking to the church, the benefit is for everybody to come together and be edified at the same time. As we come together as the ecclesia, the called out ones. The better thing is for everyone to be edified at the same time where no one's showing off. No one's making themselves look spiritual or hyper-spiritual. No one's trying to, you know, make anybody else think that there's something that they're not. No one's using the body of Christ as a stage to play off their spiritual gifts to get some pats on the back. 
or to get some people to come up to you after church and say, wow, that was really supernatural, man. You're really in touch with the Spirit. Because that's what happens a lot of times. People just show off. And very similar in prayers. And sometimes when I pray, when we pray corporately, every so often, I mean, you guys, listen, you guys have been around me long enough. You guys know that I'm not all that eloquent. I just kind of speak the Word of God and use what the gifts He's given me. If I started to pray and I started to speak like Yoda, <laughs> you would think that there was something wrong with me. Because that's not how I talk. If, it, if I started to speak in old King James English when I started to pray corporately, you would think, coming from me, that would be hilarious, first of all. And you would think that I was out of my mind. Like, all of a sudden, is he okay? Does he need a drink of water? Is he all right? Because that's not how we talk. And all too often times, all of a sudden, somebody will start to pray corporately or pray in a circle. And all of a sudden, you just change everything. You change everything, the way you say it, your pronunciation, your enunciation, how you put words together. All of a sudden, people start praying like Yoda. And it doesn't make any sense. That's just not legit. That's just showing off. That's just not. I'm sorry. But you, what you're really just trying to do is you're just trying to, I mean, I don't know, show off your eloquence or just, you know, you want to put some words together. You want to be like the human thesaurus. That's cool. I mean, whatever. If that, I mean, you know, but really, why are you doing that? Because that's not how you talk to people. You think you're fooling God by talking that way? You're not. You're not fooling the Lord. He knows you. This is not how you speak normally. It's not how you write normally. You got to get real. Just get real. And, and the reality is, as we, as we look through this, this is really the motive of Paul's heart. He just wants people to be legit. Just get real when you're praying. Don't show off. You don't got to start flopping around like a fish to show yourself as spiritual. Just pray. Tongues is not something that can be taught either. You go to some churches, they say, well, we're going to teach you how to pray in tongues. And they say, okay, and listen, I've been through some of these classes. It's really kind of creepy. <laughs> All right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody, just kind of uh, loosen your tongue. And then just go. And that's what they, listen, that's what they try to do. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay. Mama say, mama sa, mama tu sa. Mama say, mama sa, mama tu sa. Right? Oh, they just start teaching. Like, how, okay, now what you got to do is you just kind of, all right, now breathe a little bit. Breathe. Look at, you're laughing because it's nonsense. That is the proper response. Nonsense. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen as a gift. It's going to happen as a gift. And God is going to bestow this gift upon you as a spiritual gift to edify the church. But before it edifies the church, it will always edify the individual first. If it's going to happen, you'll know. How will you know? When you're home praying by yourself. And all of a sudden, you're just overwhelmed with the Spirit. And the Spirit gives you a little bit of faith to start speaking in a tongue. And you don't got to practice. He gives it to you. It's a gift. Just like your salvation. You don't got to earn it. He just gives it to you. Here you go. Free gift. All right. As we move on, some interpretive challenges. Here we go. Verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice, be babes. But in, in, in understanding, be mature. Okay, so he's, he wants, he's kind of trying to get them to snap out of it. Don't be children. Be mature. I'm trying to handle, or hand you um, some biblical truth here that you need to understand. So don't be malicious with this information. Don't use the word of God and the authority that I'm giving you as a sledgehammer. Be mature. Handle this rightly. When I give you this information, you want to take this, you want to deliver it to the church, make sure that you're handling this with the proper maturity and spiritual maturity that God has given you. In the law, it is written, men with other tongues or men of other tongues 
and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophecy and an, but if all prophesy rather, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. Now, at first glance, you read that, it sounds a little contradictive. It sounds like Paul isn't making much sense. Because what he says here is he says, tongues are a sign, not for those who believe, but for the unbeliever. Interesting. Because he just got done saying that you can't do it unless you're a believer, and when you do it, you've got to edify yourself. And if you do it in the church, I mean, it has to be interpreted. So it's got to be done right. So what are you saying, Paul? He gives us the interpretation in verse 21. In the law it's written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Tongues in the Old Testament, even more specifically in Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12, tongues in the Old Testament was a sign of judgment because Israel wasn't heeding the Lord. And so what Paul says this, in the Old Testament, it was a sign of judgment. My people aren't listening to my voice. My people aren't listening to my prophets. They're not heeding the word of God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send them into judgment from people and other nations of other tongues, and then they will have to listen. In the church, corporately, the judgment comes when an unbeliever comes into the church corporately, and all they see is tongues being operated out of order. All they see is tongues being used out of order. And an unbeliever comes in and goes, um, quackadoo, gotta go. You guys are all nuts, jumping around like crazy people, speaking in a language that I can't understand. By the way, speaking in a language that you can't understand either. Gotta go. Judgment. That doesn't do anybody any good. Not only is it not edifying the unbeliever, but it's not edifying the believers corporately as a church. Right? But, in verse 24, if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Listen, that's in order. That's why it's more important to speak five words in a known tongue than 10,000 in an unknown. That's order. When an unbeliever comes into a church and somebody gives them a word that edifies, that exhorts, that encourages, like a word of prophecy is supposed to do. When somebody comes in, when an unbeliever, unbeliever comes into a church and all of a sudden somebody witnesses the gospel to them, and that might take five minutes to do, that's more important than speaking an entire church service in an unknown tongue. Out of order, cause for confusion all over the place. Unbelievers will leave, but if they get edified, if they get encouraged, if they're spoken to in a known tongue, they repent. Do you understand that? Listen, years ago, when I came back to the Lord a long time ago, just to kind of give you an idea. The church that I came back to the Lord in was really, really, really cessationist. Okay? Really cessationist. They taught that if anybody spoke in tongues, they were of the devil. If anybody prophesied, the gift of prophecy was no longer in use. However, I'll say this to you. Years ago, I went to this church. I was out of my mind. Crazy lunatic. And I went into this church, and I wound up going there because my folks were going there, and it was filled with a bunch of ex-bikers and hell's angels and guys that I just kind of dug, right? I went into this place, and the pastor there was an ultra-cessationist. And he stood up at the pulpit one day, and he had a bunch of notes in front of him. And he closed his book, and he stepped out from the pulpit. And he just looked out at the crowd, and he goes, man, he goes, 
I don't know who this is for. He goes, I don't know if this is for anybody here. He goes, but the Lord just gave me something, and I want to give it to you. He says, I just want to let you know that Jesus loves you. And I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And it was so simple that even to this day, I can't even talk about it without getting emotional. It was so simple. Jesus loves you, and he forgives you. And he went on and on and on about the love and the grace of Christ and the mercy of Jesus. He just went on. He stepped outside the pulpit. And then he went further and says, you know something? He goes, I don't know if you're here, if this is even for anybody here again. He goes, but I just want to let you know Jesus loves you and you need to stop running from God. Stop running. You've been running your entire life. He goes, you've been running like Jonah. And I'm just sitting there. I got, listen, I literally have about, I, listen, I'm not kidding you. I got probably about $500 of crystal meth stuck up my nose. It's a real story. I was leaving church that night to go shoot myself. True story. And he says, you've been running your whole life like Jonah. And I'm sitting there now. I'm like, he's got my attention. I'm dying. I'm literally just sweating. I can't even believe it. Tears rolling down my face. I'm just looking around. Nobody even knows my name. I don't even know who this guy is. And he was somebody who didn't believe in the gift of prophecy. Do you understand that? This was a pastor who didn't believe in the gifts of prophecy because that's a gift that's not around anymore. Meanwhile, he was prophesying to me right then. A pagan unbeliever, lost in my sins, dead in my trespasses and sins. And he just used by God and said, Jesus loves you and stop running. And it saved my life. It saved my life. Literally, I wouldn't even be here today if that one guy wasn't sensitive to the Holy Spirit using him, even if he didn't believe it. It was a miracle. Now, that's what a word of edification will do. There was no tongue speaking in that church. That I can guarantee you. And so people will come into this church and say, why don't we see that happening here? Why don't we see tongues? Why don't we see the gifts of the Spirit being operated here? And I say, because you're looking for the wrong thing. You should be looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Not just the gifts. You should be looking for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Order. That's what we look for. Because there's more benefit to that than just speaking in tongues. Which is why we'll do it. We'll preach and edify on Sunday. We'll make ways and times for people to use their gifts and to speak in a tongue if they want to. We'll use worship times to do that. But it will not be on Sunday morning. Because it's more important for us to speak words of edification in language that you can all, that everybody here can understand. Everyone. Because somebody might fall on their face and worship God and report that God is truly among you. And that's a good report. Now, I wish I could end there but I can't. <laughs> All right. How is it, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. You see that? Anytime you go to a church where everybody's just kind of doing what they want and they're doing this for, for, as a spectacle, you're out of order. He says, two 
at the most three and not at the same time. You've got to be done in order. It's got to be each in turn and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now listen, really simple. I just want to say this. God gives us some latitude to make mistakes. You get that. He gives you personally plenty of latitude to make mistakes throughout your day-to-day life. Lots of room for grace. If this were to happen in the church, somebody stands up and says, you know, we're in the middle of a worship service, and I stand up here and say, listen, I just want to, you know, open it up for prayer, corporate prayer. If somebody has a, you know, somebody has a word, if somebody wants to pray or preach in a tongue, I want to let that be known right here and right now. And somebody stands up and speaks in a tongue, and they sit down, and nobody interprets, no problem. You know how we handle that? Really easy. Not to get anybody kind of like, you know, nervous and upset. Really easy. All you do is just say, listen, brother or sister, I think that might just be for you. It's cool. But I think that that, one, that word was probably just for you and you alone. And move on. Really simple. Not to get anybody distracted or get anybody up in arms. Just really simple. And then you move on. Go back to worship. Not to get everybody worried about, oh my goodness, were they out of order? Oh my goodness, they really weren't sensing the Spirit. People make mistakes all the time. You make mistakes, I make mistakes, so what? God's going to give us some latitude to make mistakes as a, as a body, too. Now, let two, now it's really simple, the rules of two or three. In verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Who are the others? You. You need to know the word of God. You need to know whether or not somebody is speaking something that's right or not. You need to know your Bibles because anybody can get lost in emotion. Listen to me, really simple. People can get lost, even in church life, People can get lost in emotion. People can get lost in the hubbub. People can get lost in kind of the emotion of it all and the tears. And like all of a sudden, you know, pastor starts taking his jacket off and swinging it around. You know, first three rows of people just fall down. People can get really caught up in the emotion of what they see or the emotion of what they heard. And unfortunately, we have a lot of churches now that are just purely led by emotion. We have a lot of churches now that are just led by how we feel. And not what the Bible says. Led by how it feels. How is what he's saying make me feel? Not what does the Bible actually say. So if somebody stands up and they have a word of prophecy and it makes you feel really good, that doesn't always mean that it's from God. Understand that. Somebody stands up and what they say makes you feel really good, that doesn't always mean that it's from heaven. You've got to judge if what that person is saying is biblical. Because he says this. Now watch this. But if anything is revealed to another who sits, who sits by, let them first keep silent. For you can all, for can you rather, for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Really quick, you know what he's saying there? Simple. Anybody who stands up, listen, we've all seen this happen. If you guys have been walking around with Christianity and the world of Christendom for any amount of time, we've probably all gone to a church service or two where maybe the pastor is speaking. Or maybe somebody else is speaking. And all of a sudden, just like out of nowhere, you get this like, just, just, uh, say the Lord, blah, 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 and they start, somebody just starts talking or rambling on in the back, right? And so somebody will go up to him and be like, um, what in the world were you doing? Oh, I'm really sorry. You know, the Holy Spirit just came upon me and oh, I was just filled with the Spirit and I just couldn't hold it in anymore. And they go to the prophet Jeremiah where, oh, the word of God was burning inside me. I just couldn't believe it. It just kind of came out of me, and the Holy Spirit just took me over. Uh, nope, he didn't. Not according to the Word of God, he didn't. Because the Spirit of the prophet is subject to who? The prophet. So that means that God just doesn't come in and take over your body. He doesn't come in and just kind of step right in, and, just, uh, and then you can just stand and say, Thus saith the Lord. That's not how it works. Not at all how it works. If you do that, you're out of order. Out of order. But here's the thing. 
if somebody stands up and they're given a word of prophecy, it might not be great news, but if it's the word of God, it should bring peace. Do you understand? I don't like every single thing that the Bible says sometimes. But you know why I have peace with it? Because it's the word of God. That brings peace. Truth brings peace. Love rejoices, 1 Corinthians 13, in the truth. That's why he's not the author of confusion. But of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. All right, you ready? Ladies, here we go. This is when you can leave and get all mad at me. Now, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interpret this for you, so don't get, get, all, get all crazy on me yet. Let your women keep silent in the churches. All right, I'll see you guys next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, in verse 35, that word speak in the church is leleo. That literally means it's shameful for a woman to argue, to chatter, to quarrel, or to question. Really simple. Not just speak. Okay? There are some churches who take this literally. But let me just explain to you what's going on here, okay? Because you interpret Scripture three ways. Literally, historically, grammatically, right? Here's what was going on. They were going to church. The Corinthian church coming together on the Lord's Day on a Sunday. They'd file into church, and they set up church like they set up the synagogues. Synagogues had guys on one side, girls on the other, okay? They would come in. They would sit down. Lots of couples, married folks. Husbands would go over here. Wives would go over here. And here's what's happening. Pastor would stand up. They'd do a little bit of worship. Pastor would stand up getting ready to preach. And then what happens? Well, what happens is, what happens a lot of times when guys and gals get together, but in separate groups. Men will sit down, shoulder to shoulder, won't say two words to each other, because we don't need to say a lot. We just sit down and say, what's happening? Hey, good to see you. All right, Billy, Bobby, Joe, yep, praise God. Good, all right, let's see what the pastor got to say. That's it, no handshakes, no nothing, right? Ladies get together, what happens? Oh, my goodness, Jill, how you doing? Good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you, too. Hey, how's Bobby? Oh, he's doing great. He's going to the Coliseum, going to fight some lions and tigers. Oh, wow, how's Bobby doing? He's wonderful, going to the Praetorian Guard. Just got back from Rome. Everything's going really great. They said, just start chit-chatting, just start talking, right? And then their husbands are on the other side. Their husbands are on the other side of the church, and they're just like, oh, yeah, by the way, that recipe that you gave me was wonderful. I really liked it. My husband loved it. You know, and they just start talking. They just start chit-chatting and talking like, Women do. This is, I'm not talking out of school. This is known. Everybody knows this. You just start chit-chatting and talking, and they start turning and facing each other, and just da 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 That's what happens, right? So then all of a sudden the pastor starts to talk, starts to preach, and all of a sudden one of the ladies says, um, excuse me, pastor, I don't, can you explain that again? And Billy, the husband, is over there going, oh, no, just sit down, just, oh, no, I'll talk to you later, you know? No, I want to talk to him now. Tell me what that means. She's coming out from underneath her head. She's coming out from underneath her covering. She's speaking out of order in the church. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us simple, women can pray, can prophesy, can do all of that stuff. Nothing wrong with it. But it's got to be done in order. Married women should be doing that under the covering of a husband. Single ladies need to be doing that under the covering of a church. And it should be done in order. It's really simple. It doesn't forbid it. Just as if it's going to be done, it's going to be done in order. And they just can't be shameful or chattering or arguing with the pastor from the from where they're sitting. I don't agree with that. Come on, Joe, we got to go. Billy's got a baseball game, got to beat it. He just says no. So he's not telling women to be quiet all the time. 
If you've got questions, ask your husband or bring your husband up or make sure that whatever it is you're doing, you're doing it in the order that God has put forth in the word of God. He's not forbidding women to go to church or just be silent. You know, like, we, again, in our culture, we immediately assume that mo- any churches that stand on the word of God, all of a sudden, you know, we, we just immediately assume that, you know, the church or anybody that really believes in the word of God, they just want to put their foot on the throat of women. Not at all. And let me just say this to you. There is no greater liberator of women than Jesus Christ. No greater liberator. None. In fact, I would say that most of what calls itself the feminist movement cuts the legs out from underneath women, to be honest with you. It shames women into being women, into being more like men. Women who want to really develop because they've been given abilities and gifts. I get two daughters and two sons. And they're totally different. Totally different. And we live in a culture now where we shame women into being more like men. I don't want my wife to be like me. I just don't. I like my wife that she's opposite. I like the fact that my wife is completely different and thinks different. And she adds something. She's a benefit to my life. And we live in a world today that refuses to bless women and tells women that in order to be successful, you need to be like men. And men, you need to be like women. You need to get in touch with your sensitive side and your feminine side. No, I don't. I don't have one. And I don't want women to get in touch with their masculine side. Neither does God. He's made us different for a reason. But in no way, shape, or form is this word saying that women are not valued. They're not. It's just, it's their women are valued by God. Blessed of the Lord. Given incredible opportunities by Christ to raise up the new generation. And when things are done in order, it blesses the Lord. When things are done properly, it blesses Jesus Christ. And in no way, shape, or form Does the word of God promote stifling women? Making sure women know their place, so to speak. That's just idiocy. But he wants you to be used the way that he made you. And to be a blessing to Christ and to kingdom the way he made you. And he's got order in the church. And in terms of what the Bible says about roles of men and women in the body of Christ, it simply has nothing to do with aptitude or ability or competency. It has nothing to do with any of those things. In fact, many oftentimes, women can be more apt and more able and more competent than men in many, many, many areas. However, when it comes to the church, he just puts in order, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the man. Man is the head of the woman. And it's only because he said so. It's got nothing to do with ability or aptitude or competency. Nothing to do with that at all. When we come together as a church and as a fellowship, it's just order, man. Just order. This is the role. And I just want to say this to you because you know what Paul's going to say? Look at this in verse 36. Or did the word of God come originally from you? (laughs) Or was it you only that it, w- that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let them be ignorant. Listen, you know what Paul says real quick? He says, the word of God is the word of God, and you can fight against it all you want, but it is the authority in our lives. And the word of God has the right to tell us what to do. Please know that. 
The Word of God has the authority in our lives to tell us how to live and how to operate, even more specifically in the body of Christ. And so what Paul says is this. He goes, if you don't want to believe me, that's cool. If you're choosing to be ignorant, that's fine too. If you want to prove out what I'm saying is right, then do that. But if you choose not to and you just want to believe what you want, you just kind of want to go off and believe whatever it is you want to believe based on emotion or your feelings or whatever. Proverbs 26, 4 says, Don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. If somebody just wants to disagree with you, then just let them disagree. If they want to argue with them, let them argue by themselves. But the word of God is the word of God, and it stands, and it's true, and it's what we need. We see what's happening in our culture. Listen, if our culture is so right, take a look around, dude. I'm going long. Follow me. Listen, sermonettes are for Christianettes. Listen to me. Listen, take a look at our culture. Take a look at what's going on around us. Our culture has got it all wrong. It used to be about 15, 20 years ago that they had some things wrong. They got everything crooked now. Everything crooked. It's insane what we see happening in our culture today. So no, I'm sorry. You can call me old-fashioned. But I will trust the word of God which has withstood the test of time since the beginning of time. And what it says and how we are to operate in the body of Christ. Husbands, wives, men, women, children, corporately, spiritual gifts, practical gifts, teaching, edifying, loving, serving. No, no, no. I will trust the Bible because it's the only thing that has withstood the test of time. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass. But if you think you know better, then go ahead. You can challenge the word of God if you want to. Jesus loves you. You're not going to get very far. Lots of people have been trying to do that for years. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. And don't forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently. And note this. Here it is. My favorite word. And in order. Now listen. I had to get through all this. I know I stayed. I kept you guys long. I wish I could have ended in verse 25. But we're getting into some heavy stuff with the resurrection next couple of weeks. And we're going to be there for a little while. But I just want you guys to know this. Gifts that God bestows upon the church and gifts that he bestows upon individuals should be used for his glory. It's not to be used just to edify ourselves. Well, I've been given the gift of this and I can do this and da-da-da-da. That's not what the body of Christ is for. The body of Christ is not for you to flex your spiritual muscles. It's the bride of Christ. Purchased in his own blood. He cares for how it's being used and how it's being cared for. And I want to say this also to you. The times that we're living in right now, if there was ever a time for us to stand firm on the word of God, now is that time. If there was ever a time for us to really dig into the truth, if there was ever a time for us to sit there and take a look at what's going on in our culture and say, absolutely not. I'm going to stick to the word of God and what it says, and it's going to teach me how to operate and how to live in this age. And I will trust it. It is the authority of my life. And the world won't like you because you will not conform. You will not say what's going on in the world is okay. You won't. I won't. And because of that, the world is going to hate you. But be of good cheer. It only hates you because it hated him first. Let's stand, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, praise you. I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, I thank you that you minister to our hearts. Lord, I thank you that you, you're just so good. Thank you for the word that you give us. Thank you for the time that you give us. I thank you, Lord, for just ministering to our hearts in miraculous ways that each one of us today came here this morning, 
hearing what it is you have to say to us corporately and individually, Lord. We love you. I thank you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room now that doesn't know you, I pray that today, Lord, that they would come to know you. I pray if there's anyone here this morning who's never prayed to receive Christ, Lord, that today they wouldn't leave this place without knowing that heaven is their home. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone in here not saved, Lord, that they would pray to know you and that they would be born again. Lord, and for those of us that know you, I pray that we would operate rightly, that we would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. We know that you do. Be with us as we leave, as we lift up our voices to heaven. I pray, Lord, that you would cover us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.